Good morning, everyone. Hope you're having a fantastic day. It's bright and early. For some reason, Twitch chat's going off this morning. We have Natty Witt and Old Wisco. Good morning, good morning. Hope you're having a great, great day. Today's a hectic day. I have just taken James to school. Then I have this. Then I have a private webinar with some students right after this. Then I have a call with a potential new poker coach and coach later today. Things, things are popping off for poker coaching. Somehow we've brought on multiple multi-million dollar winning coaches recently. We have another one perhaps coming on. All people who I like personally, all who I think are great at poker. And that, that's exciting. That's exactly what we're going for. Trying to get the best people in the world who are crushing it right now to teach all of you and me to play poker better. So, I get this question a lot. How do you chip up in poker tournaments? So that is what we are going to be discussing today. Because chipping up in tournaments is important. Before I get started with this, though, I currently have a package available for all of you that I made with Michael Acevedo. He wrote the book, Modern Poker Theory. You can see it right back down there. And I actually did a webinar with him where he reviewed one of my hand histories against all world-class opponents. I was probably the worst person in the field. It was a very high stakes online small field tournament and i played some hands great and i played some hands poorly and um well he went through analyzed all those and that's good and beneficial and he's going to be going through the rest of those for poker coaching members um later this week so he went through only five or ten of my hands in our session that's available on youtube you can check that out at poker or youtube.com slash poker coaching and they'll be going the rest through the rest of those for poker coaching members later this week on Thursday, I believe. But he has gone through many of the most common spots that you will encounter, like from the big blind, right? Like say someone raises and you defend the big blind. What do you do pre-flop and then after the flop with much of your range? And he discusses as the big blind, as the pre-flop raiser, discusses all sorts of very common spots that you will encounter on a regular basis and discusses when and why you should be adjusting from GTO. So definitely check that out. You can get access to all those videos and much, much more at pokercoaching.com slash GTO. Here, I'll type it right here in the chat. Pokercoaching.com slash GTO. Go there, check it out. We put a lot of work into making this package excellent for all of you. So don't miss out. Don't miss out. When, when you play cash, how long or how low do you get before adding on? I add on pretty much immediately. I like to have the maximum in most scenarios, or I want to have as much as the person on my right or the few people on my right, assuming I have a bad seat. That was a super webinar. It was a super webinar, so that was good. So today we're going to discuss chipping up in tournaments. The question was, how do you consistently chip up in tournaments? And the problem is that, well, you can't do anything consistently, consistently, like every single time in poker, because that just isn't how the game works, Right? realize that sometimes you're just going to have all bad cards. Sometimes your opponents are just going to flop top pair of your hand. And you know what? You're going to lose them. And there's nothing you can do about it. And that is okay. A lot of people think they're supposed to win all the time. What are you doing, Shark? Get over there. A lot of people think they're supposed to win all the time, and that's just factually not true. You're going to have big swings in poker, and that is okay. Okay? So first off, understand you're going to have swings in poker, especially in poker tournaments, because of the payout structure, especially in tournaments, right? Realize that the payout structure of tournament disproportionately rewards deep runs, okay? You make money when you win the tournament. You don't really make much money when you cash the tournament, yet you hear loads of recreational players discussing or about or bragging about how they cashed. They're so happy when they cash. If you're in any poker tournament, people will be clapping and cheering when they cash. And you may say, well, yeah, they're happy they got some money back. They won. They won. But no, they didn't win. Nothing's happened. They got back their buy-in plus some change. Getting back your buy-in plus some change is not really worth a whole lot. And for that reason, you should not really care all that much about getting in the money. Now, obviously, there are some spots where you should care about getting in the money. Like if you have a tiny stack on the bubble, yeah, you should probably care about getting in the money. Or if you have a tiny stack at the final table, 
yeah, you should probably worry about moving up from ninth place to seventh place, right? But the vast majority of the time, people who are really, really playing to move up la the payout ladder don't really move all the way up the ladder to the top. And most of the money goes to the top few spots. Okay, fine. So knowing that, what do you think the adjustments are that most people need to make? Take a second, think about it. It can all be summed up with uh, a few words. Matthew says, first time you're live here. Good morning, good morning. Well, the answer is don't be a nit. Don't sit there and wait for only good cards because you're inevitably not going to get enough good cards to essentially make it deep in tournaments just by getting hit by the deck. You're not going to get hit by the deck often enough, and that is A-OK. -okay. The King says you're on the biggest upswing of your life. You got second, third, and first in the last three days. Feels good. Yeah, it's nice whenever you're running hot. Congrats. Top of the morning from Texas. Good morning, good morning. You're an hour earlier than me. Goodness. Okay, so when you're not a nit, realize that you are going to encounter even more swings to your game because inevitably you're going to cash less often than the nits. The nits are actually going to cash a decent amount of the time. There's plenty of players out there who cash 25% of the tournaments they play. And you know what? The vast majority of them lose money. And the reason that a lot of those players lose money is because they don't win the poker tournament all that often, right? So understand and accept that. However, if you do play more pots, you're going to have more swings. The thing is, though, is that if you are having more swings, but they're generally in the upward direction, that's going to be good. You're going to slowly trickle up, right? You will slowly trickle up as opposed to slowly trickling down or slowly trickling at about break even, which is what happens if you just wait for good cards. So you need to figure out how to play lots of pots with a small edge or big edge, but it's hard to have a big edge if you're playing lots of pots, right? So understand that. Terry says, where are you on GPI? We're in the top four for the Poker Player of the Year Award or Poker Personality of the Year Award. I don't know if that's what you're referring to. Then you say 350. Oh, you must not be able to consult Google. Listen, anytime you have a question for Google, consult Google and you will find the answer to the vast majority of those questions. Where am I at on the Global Poker Index? Probably not very high because I haven't played very much, right? If you're not, if you're new here, then realize over the last three years, I have transitioned away from playing poker all day every day because I have two kids and I want to stay home with my kids. And there's a lot of value in that to me. My goal is not to be the number one poker player. And that's A-OK, -okay, right? My goal is to be a good father and to help all of you be the best poker players you can be. So the thing at the top, I don't know, let, hey, we can consult Google, right? Let's see. Nice and easy. I'll tell you exactly where I am on GPI. It'll take one second. Jonathan Little GPI. We're going to find the answer for you right now. It's probably not very high because this is based on volume, right? Any volume-based system, if you don't put in volume, you're not going to be very high on it. Yeah, so current, 1,138th. 1,338. Despite not playing, I guess that's not so not so bad, given I haven't played any. Um, the way GPI is based is they take the top four caches you have every quarter, and inevitably I'm playing like what? Five tournaments a quarter, 10 tournaments a quarter? That means I should only have one or two caches a quarter? So if I should only have one or two caches a quarter, yet everyone else who's in the ranking has four caches a quarter, obviously you're not gonna be very high up the ranking, right? Common sense. Um, back when I was playing the most, highest was number 24. It's not so bad. So yeah, that's it. 1,338th place, not so great. 24th, not so long ago though. Back when I was playing a lot, right? If you play a lot, you go up high on the ranks. If you play a lot, and really, the way you get high on these rankings as they are currently set up, is you play a lot of high stakes tournaments. You play a lot of high stakes tournaments, you're gonna be in the top 100, you just are. And if you're not, you're probably not very good. But if you don't play a lot, well then inevitably it's just impossible to be in the top 100 because it's based on four caches per quarter. And in order to get four caches per quarter, you need to play what, 25 tournaments at least? So that's a, what, a tournament uh, every three days? Obviously I'm not playing a tournament every three days. I've been home with my wife and kids most of the time. Anyway, any question you have for Google, just search Google, right?
Are there any players I learned from? Yeah, the book co- poker coaches at pokercoaching.com. I personally hired all of them because I think I can learn a lot from them. And if I think I can learn a lot from them, then uh, you can probably learn a lot from them. The topic for today, though, we're going to try to stay on topic for a little bit, is how do we chip up? Because I actually have to go relatively soon because I have, um, I have a webinar today with some of my students. Why do I speak like a know-it-all? Slow your roll. Yeah, well... Believe it or not, I only speak about things that I do know about. It's important to realize that most people talk because they like to sound like know-it-alls, but I only talk about things that I actually know about. Realize, we don't talk about most topics here purposely because I don't know anything about them. It's very important to realize what you are good at and what you are bad at or what you're just ignorant about, right? I'm ignorant about a lot of things because I have not studied those things, right? But we study poker a ton and we've learned poker from the absolute best players in the world. And inevitably, whenever you study a lot and you get very good at something, people would like to learn those skills from you, right? So understand that um, that's relevant. Do I listen to the Chip Race podcast? Absolutely not. They are incredibly negative there and like spreading fibs. I do not um, like gossip so much, and they are a gossip-based podcast. I tend to not listen to nonsense. So listen. It's very important to realize that you, whatever you put into your brain is what you will become, what you will think, what you will know, what you will discuss. And if you are into dragging people's name through the mud, or if you're into gossip, or if you're into just being a negative human, well, then inevitably, that's what you're going to turn into, right? If you are a positive person, an upbeat person, someone who is trying to help people and better the world, well, you'll probably end up doing those things. And I mean, I've been on both sides of the coin. Back when I was young, I was I was a young, dumb idiot. Like we discussed many times here, I have made plenty of mistakes in my life, and I used, I used to be a negative person. You know what? Life was negative back then. I was unhappy. Turns out, though, your mindset really does impact how you feel about life and how you, um, how you appreciate life, right? And you have to make the most of it. So anyway, back on topic, how to chip up in tournaments consistently. Realize you can't do it consistently, but you can do it more consistently if you have a higher win rate. If you have a higher win rate, your results are going to trickle up, right? If you have a lower win rate, they're not going to trickle up as fast. So these strategies will lead to more variance within every individual tournament. But, but, the hands you play within a tournament don't actually matter all that much, right? So what you really care about is how you do in each individual game. So the swings you experience at the table don't actually matter all that much. What matters is what is your ROI per tournament and then what volume are you putting in, right? So let's see. Let's get to the actual strategies. Obvious one is raise more preflop, right? How to chip up, three betting, check raising boards, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so Louis Philippe knows all these things. He's been studying me for quite a while. First things first is just play more hands preflop. Raise more preflop and three bet more preflop, especially against players who are not going to respond aggressively. Now, if you're playing against the best players in the world, as I was doing the other day when Michael Acevedo was reviewing my hand history, again, you can check that out at um, youtube.com slash poker coaching or get access to that webinar and many, many more that Michael has made at pokercoaching.com slash GTO. There... I was playing against the best players in the world, which sort of forced me to play good, fundamentally sound ranges without getting so far out of line, right? But you're not going to be playing against the best players in the world the vast majority of the time, okay? So knowing that, you want to look for things they do incorrectly. And most people in most tournaments, besides exactly the very medium stakes, usually these are like $500-ish buy-ins that are kind of big tournaments for those players, um, if you're playing like small six games or even medium six games, whatever, that's not such like people in there are reasonable. Um, in those games, most people play a little bit too tight and a little bit too conservatively. So inevitably you will profit by playing a little bit more aggressively than you should or than you may think you should. So that's going to lead to more preflop raising, more preflop three betting, more flat calling from late position, just seeing flops in position, especially when you're deep stacked, right? Basically, you want to play hands because when you play hands... What happens is you get to see more flops and you get to realize your equity better, which is inevitably going to let you chop up the blinds and antes more often. And imagine you chop up the blinds and antes half of the time or a third of the time, yet the other players at the table chop up the blinds and antes 15% of the time. 
that's just money going into your pocket, right? So if you can figure out how to realize your equity in these scenarios and perhaps even over-realize your equity because your opponents let you and you don't let them, well, then you're going to slowly chip up, right? Because imagine if your opponents play 12 hands per tournament, but you play 50, even if your edge is much smaller, you're just going to be consistently crushing in these scenarios. Poker coaching coach Matt Affleck says... People play too loose in early position and too tight in later positions. Yeah, I agree. They do. Most people play what's referred to as a static preflop range selection, right? They play the same hands or roughly the same hands for most positions, and that's a mistake. You give some people the king-10 offsuit under the gun and they're raising it, which is horrible, horribly bad. Yet you give other people the king-2 suited on the button and they fold it. Horribly, horribly bad, right? So two mistakes that very often the same people make. Not sure why you think that advice seems contradictory. That's just 100% accurate. Matt Affleck is a world-class player, and he's a coach at PokerCoaching.com. Go there. Check him out. I think he does four webinars a month for Poker Coaching and Poker Coaching Premium members, and he's going through his hands, going through the students' hands, and making everyone a whole lot better. So thanks to Matt for that. In small tournaments, should you just insta-fold to large three-bets and shoves? If people aren't bluffing enough, yeah. You want to exploit what the opponents are doing wrong. You say you feel like people aren't bluff shoving enough. Well, get data. Actually figure that out, right? But what if you do figure that out to be factually true, then yeah, fold more often. I mean, an easy, easy example is to say you raise button with like ace 10 offsuit. Not ace 9 offsuit. Let's make it a little bit worse because ace 10 is pretty good. Let's say you raise ace 9 offsuit on the button and then the small blind jams for 20 big blinds and you um, know that player to be very weak and tight. Could easily be a fold with the ace 9 offsuit there. But against a good player, you just literally... Never fold, right? Because you're in great shape against a GTO strategy. Your friend, you were talking some smaller to deep tournaments. You start deep stacked, 400 to 500 big blinds. You were saying you like to increase your opening range significantly when everyone is calling due to being very light. Eh, from late position, sure. From early position, not so much. Playing out of position is really bad when you're deep stacked. So I would not widen my range too much. 400 to 500 big blinds deep, you have to be aware that even like pretty good hands like 8-6 suited go way down in value because you're going to be making like bad straights and bad flushes, and you really don't want bad straights or bad flushes when you're 500 big blinds deep. So I would be wider from late position, tighter from earlier position. And you're going to find that's usually just the case across the board. Um, as you get deeper, you have to be a little bit more conservative from early position, because you want to be playing either just like really good hands or hands that make the nuts. Is there a sequence of classes? If you're a Poker Coaching Premium member, first thing you should do is go to the 30-day challenge, if you've not done that already. Go through the whole 30-day challenge, and that will get you up to speed, and you'll have something to do every day for the next 30 days. So that is a very, very good starting point. I look better with facial hair. Does that mean I have an ugly face? I just haven't shaved in a few days. Should you raise bigger to get fewer callers? Um, depends on your strategy, right? Also, realize when you make it 6x, you're not really winning anything preflop, right? That's the important thing is like you don't mind going post-flop when you're very deep because you want to try to stack your opponents. You're not like playing there to try to steal the blinds because the blinds and antis are irrelevant. You're playing there to try to stack your opponents. And you do that by playing pots with them, not by making them fold out their junk. You want them in with their junk. Oh, When you flop a set, do you raise or not? Depends on your opponent's strategy. I'm drinking what looks like scotch. Yeah, this is straight scotch in the morning. You all don't drink scotch before a long day of webinars and teaching your students how to play poker? What's wrong with you? Actually, this is Poo-er Tea. Got a new shipment in recently from David's Tea. I love David's Tea. I found this new app on my computer. I forget what it's called. Basically, there are some websites where it'll just like randomly give you back cryptocurrency. Whenever you buy from them. David Steve gave 3% back in cryptocurrency just for like no real reason whatsoever. Some plugin you can get. It's completely free. Whenever you go to a website, they will um, they'll give you back some percentage in cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, whenever you buy from random specific sites. So it's pretty cool. 3% is not a lot. Like some of them get back 20%. They don't give you back anything on Amazon. I buy all my stuff on Amazon. This is called poo -er I like it. How do you spell it? I don't know. Google... Not, not poo herb. Don't Google poo herb. Okay, poker coaching premium students join this webinar today. Unfortunately, they cannot. This is for the inner circle, which I am winding down, most likely. But the class I'm going to be teaching, when to adjust from GTO and tournaments, will be 
uh, for the Poker Coaching Premium members, so you basically get access to it anyway. All right, so next, we know we need to play more pots. However, against players who are also loose, aggressive, etc., against players like that, you should probably be more way inclined to hero call down. So how do you make it easier for you to hero call down against players who are going to be bluffing you too frequently? So remember I said most people are a little bit too weak and too passive. Some players are going to be in there battling. This is definitely the case. I remember when I used to go play at Venetian, it was kind of like a joke that the players who played at Venetian all the time were way too loose, way too splashy, and had huge ego problems. I don't know why that was the case in that specific venue, but it was. So you just sit there, play good hands, and then don't fold them. So inevitably, what would happen is you would um, play slightly tighter ranges preflop, and then do a whole lot of checking. You basically set them up to bluff you. So... Understand that's what you want to be doing, right? Figure out what they do wrong and then adjust to exploit them. That's really all we're talking about here. How do you adjust to exploit your opponents to crush them? And now I realize this strategy forces you to kind of make good hands or at least decent hands. But like middle pair is good if your opponents can be bluffing off too often, especially if they think that you are a little bit too tight and a little bit too passive. So trap them to death. James L., Mr. James Little here. Good morning, son. You're supposed to be in school right now, James L., Believe it or not, James actually goes by James L at school because there are two Jameses in his class. And he's, we always ask him, like, so what's your name? He says, James L. <laughs> he thinks his name's James L. Should you wear your poker coaching patches during cash games and tournaments you play? Sure, if you feel like it. What about on Twitch streams? Definitely. Definitely in Twitch streams. That would be very beneficial for me. Thank you. If you have a Twitch stream, send us an email. Support at pokercoaching.com. Maybe we can give you an affiliate deal. Maybe you can start uh, promoting poker coaching on there. We have a few people promoting co poker coaching on stream. We actually do a stream... Every Saturday morning with uh, God's Big Toe and Crazy Sixes. They are two streamers who I'm friendly with. And they do a stream every Saturday for about an hour or so where they go through and they um, go, go through poker coaching quizzes. And it's fun. Took you forever to realize that most people think that you're supposed to call down to the river unless your hand improves. Don't know what that means. You're supposed to, you're supposed to call down to the river until their hand improves. Um, bad players think that. All right, well, Jake, send us an email once you're up and, go, up and running. Take a note, Jonathan. Okay. Um, first time here. Good morning, Darren. Hope you're having a great day. You're very welcome for helping you expand your knowledge. Every time somebody raised, people went all in preflop. The issue is you started with only a shallow stack. You didn't raise often and struggled to chip up. So look, if your opponents are jamming, jamming at a lot preflop and jamming frequently preflop, then just play good cards, right? And, and again, this question was, what about when you're card dead? Well, you lose. Sorry. Good game. Um, that said, a lot of people don't jam nearly often enough when people raise in front of them. I had a weekly poker hand episode just the other day that inspired me to make a video for YouTube. It'll go up probably this week or the next, where someone raised, I think, hijack seat. Someone called button, and I had 9-8 um, suited or 10 9 suited, 9 8 suited, something like that. I had one of those hands in the big blind. Calling there is like perfectly fine and valid play with your 20 big blind stack. But I think jamming is actually very reasonable. I went through and did the math and showed that if the opponents aren't calling quite enough, that you should be jamming very, very frequently in this scenario. So when you have 20 big blinds, if someone raises, you can easily be all in with a pretty wide range. If you think your opponents are raising too wide and will not call enough. So if they're raising too wide, that's usually going to be when they're in late position. If you are, um, if they just open too wide in general, you can jam on those players. What happens is if they're raising like 60 or 70% of hands, they just aren't going to call off all that often. They'll call off maybe 15, 20% of the time or 15 to 20% range, which is, you know, 30-ish percent of the time. So what happens is 60 to 70% of the time, you just win the pot immediately, which is great. And then of that other time you get called 30-ish percent of the time, Maybe 18% of the time you go broke, 12% of the time you get a double. Either way, it's fine when you're sitting there with 20 big blinds, right? So that's the spot where a lot of people really screw up by calling too often. Is this scotch? No, scotch has too much alcohol for right now. Is this apple juice? No, al apple juice has way too much sugar for right now. I currently have zero scotch and zero apple juice in my house. This is tea. It has a good amount of caffeine and not much else. This is poo -er tea. 
Evan Jarvis does free Money Friday stream where he promotes poker coaching sometimes. Great. Yeah. Glad to hear that my coaches are helping promote the site. That's exactly what we're wanting to do. All right. You said about making hero calls to a loose, aggressive player, middle pair, et cetera. If the stream went check, call, check, call, how often? Oh, you often feel scared to hero call the river. Are you being over scared? Yeah, you are. Especially when the draws miss. When a lot of draws miss, you just have to hero call stuff like middle pair. If you, um, if you have a lot of draws hit, if they're not the obvious draws, like say the low flush card comes in or the bad straight comes in and your opponent probably doesn't have too many of those, then that's relevant. Just knocked Devin Jarvis out of his home game tournament. Congrats. Get him. Are we talking about online or live as well? Saved by grace. Understand, it's very important to realize that online and live poker are exactly the same thing. So many people think, oh, these games are so different. But what is the real difference? Well, the difference is the quality of player you are playing against. When you're playing against online players, your opponents are generally just better at poker across the board, and you'll have fewer reads. Fine. It's like you're just playing against better players, right? Okay, that's the only real difference. So understand that, yes, every topic I discuss applies to live and online, unless it's very specific about, like, online timing tells or something. Everything we discuss here pertains to live and online. They're not different games, so recognize that. Okay. Recently in a tournament, pre-flop was so aggressive, et cetera, et cetera. Ace King took down on a flop. Look, I don't know what you're even saying here. I'm not, I'm not going to read this essay. Basically, you're saying when people raise and re-raise before the flop, what are you supposed to do? Well, you're supposed to play good cards, right? Recognize you're supposed to play good cards whenever your um, opponents are just like ramming and jamming, and that's a okay. Found me through YouTube, but God's big toe is the one who opened your eyes to my content. Well, good, Clark. Good chat. I'm glad to hear it. All right. Long story short, is in, in order to chip up in tournaments, you actually have to play some hands. So against the loose aggressive players, how do you get them to bluff off to you? Well, you actually have to be in there playing some pots. If you're knit, they're not going to bluff off to you unless they're just really, really bad. And you know, if you're lucky enough to play against really bad players, congrats. As you move to the middle and high stakes, everyone's gonna be at least semi-competent, right? So in that situation, you have to be playing some pots, even against those players. Now, you don't have to play big pots against those players, but you have to be involved in the pots and you have to be battling a little bit. If they think you're knit, they're not going to try to bluff you. And if they think you're knit, they're not going to hero call you when you happen to get a big hand. So you want to be figuring out exactly how to get the opponents to stack off to you poorly. And you do that by playing pots right? Realize, though, that playing pots is going to inevitably lead to swings, tournament to tournament, hand to hand, etc. And that is okay. You have to enjoy the variance. You have to love the variance and embrace the variance. But so many people do the opposite. They're afraid of it. They really want to collect that min cash. And collecting the min caches is not how you win. You win by having a big return on investment in every tournament that you play, Kind of ignoring swings tournament to tournament. And that's the exact opposite of the way a lot of people approach poker. They approach it with, all right, I have $200 in my pocket. Where's the next $200 buy-in tournament? Then they shoot it in there. Then when they get near the money, they're like, oh my God, I really have to cash. I really have to cash. We're now with 30% of the field and 15% of the field gets paid. Let me knit it up. Let me knit it up and collect an extra $82. But that is not how you win. You win by getting in there and battling. So don't be afraid to get in there and battle. Does modern poker theory discuss... Proper cold four bet spots in all situations. I don't think so. There really aren't a whole lot of those. From a GTO point of view, you probably just want to be playing good cards unless it's late position versus late position. Poker coaching coach Lexi Gavin in the house. Good morning, good morning. Hope you're having a great day. What's the bottom of your flatting range? 30 blinds effective on the button against an under the gun razor. All of this is listed at pokercoaching.com in the tool section. We have implementable GTO charts. Go there and check those out. That will answer all of your questions pertaining to that. You're on a big upswing playing $10 to $20 tournaments. You want more in two days than you ever want in your life. Congrats. What kind of shots should you be taking? Probably none. You should probably just keep playing what you're doing. Let's see. The solution to variance is a, hef a healthy bankroll. Well, you only need a healthy bankroll if you don't have a healthy edge. Nice solution 
to variance is to just play with a bigger edge. You can play with a bigger edge by playing in softer games. You can play with a bigger edge by playing in smaller field tournaments. You can play with um, structures that are flatter, but that often is not really practical. So the way this ends up happening, it, the way you end up having a big edge is inevitably having big swings. I mean, this happens in cash games too, right? Whenever my students used to ask me, like, how, how much am I swinging in cash games? I used to swing way more than all of them did. They'd be swinging, you know, 200, blinds, or 200 big blinds a session. I'd be swinging 450 big blinds a session. And why is that? I wasn't playing longer sessions than them. I was playing in just tougher games, but also with a generally more aggressive strategy. I mean, what wrecks a lot of poker players is they'll play no limit hold'em, but then they'll also go to pot limit Omaha and they'll keep the same bankroll, like same bankroll size. And you need something like three or four times bigger bankroll for pot limit Omaha than you do for no limit hold'em, just because of the variance. The variance is insane in that game. The variance in tournaments is insane. If you're used to playing 50 person tournaments at your local casino and then take that bankroll out to Vegas to play 2,000 person World Series events, well, it's a very different game. You're going to be having big, big, big swings in 2,000 person tournaments. Louis Fleet gives very actionable advice here. How to chip up. Target large race first end players and three bet them a lot. Yeah, that's it. That's, that's a very nice, easy way to do it. You fold some medium strength hands to really loose aggressive players. You bet the flop and turn and push all in on the river. You'll wait for a better spot instead of risking your tournament life. Is this a mistake? Yeah, probably. Because notice what happens here is you call the flop, you call the turn, you call the river, and then you fold. So every hand you're losing two big blinds pre-flop, three big blinds on the flop, what, six big blinds on the turn? Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. You're losing eleven big blinds over and over again, waiting for a super nut hand. And you're turning down a spot where you're getting pot odds against someone who you tell me is presumably bluffing too often. And that's obviously a big mistake. So, stop folding. Yeah, you're going to go broke more often, but you're going to just, you're going to double up more often and win the tournament more often. So I tell you, Tammy, unless you have a gigantic win rate already, maybe maybe it's just working against your player, your opponents. But if you don't have a giant win rate already, I'm just going to presume that that's not a great strategy because it's not a good strategy against good players, I can tell you that. Okay, went from 58 buy-ins to 84 just off my free content. Well, good, which drove you to subscribe to Poker Coaching. Good, that's the goal, right? I put out a lot of free stuff, not because it makes me tons of money, but because I know down the line you're going to repay me. And I'm going to help you get even better. Do good cash game players have an advantage in the early stages of tournaments? What are good cash game players good at, Peter? Take a second and think about this. What are they actually good at? How do you scan for tournaments that are soft? Well, fine tournaments that have a lot of satellite players. Satellite players across the board are worse than regular tournament players because they're used to playing tournaments that have a very different payout structure. And they're usually used to playing games about 10% the size of the current regular tournament. So you really want to play with satellite players. You also really want to play tournaments with a big guarantee because for some reason people love to go out and play tournaments with a big guarantee. No shave March. No, I just haven't shaved for two days. This is what I look like after two days without, without shaving. Okay, so cash game players are really good at playing deep stacked compared to most people. They have that skill on lockdown and they are in good shape there. So yes, good term, good cash game players have a big advantage in the early stages, which is why in like World Poker Tour tournaments, you very often see the best cash game players chip leader at the end of the day. Yet, for some reason, they don't win all that often. Why is that? Good cash game players are good at being nits. Oh, I completely disagree with that. Good cash game players are not nits. They're in there battling. I mean, good cash game players at tiny stakes are nits, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about like the ones who are not playing the small stakes. We're talking about the ones that are playing the big stakes. So good cash game players are very good with deep stacks. And inevitably, they have not studied short stack poker as well as they should have, which leads to them not playing so well with shallow stacks. And the thing is, like, they may still have a deep stack of 100 big blinds or something, and everybody else has 25, but they forget, it seems, that they're playing 25 big blind poker. Or they just play that, that uh, stage of a tournament, which is day 2, 3, 4, 5 of WPTs, with a relatively shallow or with a relatively shallowish average stack, but they're still playing deep stack strategies, or they're not adjusting quite enough, and that leads to them bleeding off stacks. Are the guaranteed tournaments the most valuable? Mm, the guarantee, like, what actually makes a tournament valuable? 
valuable. What is value? Well, a high ROI is value, right? So you want slow structures, presuming you're good, if you're good, you want slow structures and you want bad opponents. So find tournaments with slow structures and bad opponents. Just so happens that tournaments like World Poker Tour tournaments or World Series of Poker tournaments are relatively slow structured and they are and they're against bad opponents. So any like actual main event type tournament is usually pretty soft. Like any of the major Sunday tournaments that get played um, online, those are all pretty soft because a lot of players play them, right? So you always want to ask what makes a game soft and it is bad players and a slow structure. Turbo tournaments, you're not going to have a big edge on them. Tournaments against all good players or like the, um, I don't know, like let's say in your casino, they have a tournament every day, but like Thursdays usually get 20 people where Sunday gets 300 people. Well, Sunday's going to be a whole lot softer than Thursday. Just this, right? You also want um, big fields. That typically leads to bigger win rates because your win rate kind of compounds over the course of the tournament because you have more time to extract value and you get to play deeper. You get to play um, bigger blinds in terms of money at the very end of the tournament. So those things all affect win rates. But yeah, how do you chip up in tournaments? Get in there and battle and play pots. If you're a nit, you're only going to beat the small stakes games because you beat small stakes, or an easy way, easy way to beat small stakes is to just play better hands than your opponents. But that's not going to succeed as you play against better and better opponents. Are you suggesting that given many online players are playing simultaneously in multiple tournaments, their decisions don't vary in identical spots relative to how they play in a live setting? Not even sure what you're saying here. You're saying that do people mix up their play? Of course they mix up their play. That's good poker. You should not do the same thing in every single scenario. That said, whenever you are autopiloting, you typically do just play what you think is good fundamentally sound poker. But if you're playing in live poker, you do the same thing, especially in spots that are effectively automatic. So I'm not even sure what you're saying. Do online players play differently in live poker? Um, there are certainly spots where they will play differently in live poker if they think they're against an opponent who's particularly bad, right? Like if you think your opponent is particularly weak, tight, and not out, and, and like going to fold way too often, instead of playing closer to the GTO strategy, you're going to maximally exploit them, right? So you have better reads in live poker. <laughs> I heard you think satellite players are no good. You totally disagree. Why, Danny? And I didn't say no good. I said worse than generic tournament players. If you take a satellite player who's playing in a $1,000 buy-in tournament, whose average buy-in is $100, and you compare them to a tournament player whose average buy-in is $1,000, because that's the game they're playing. They're playing the $1,000 tournament, right? Which player is going to be better? Well, probably the one who's used to playing the $1,000 games, who is bankrolled for the $1,000 games, who has more experience in the $1,000 games, Etc. Etc. Are I publishing any new books anytime soon? Yeah, I have one coming out soon. Here it is. Excelling at Tough No Limit Hold'em Games. This is a book featuring me and the coaches of Pokar. Literally some of the best players in the world. We have John Van Fleet, Ape Styles, absolute crusher. He has two giant chapters. We have uh, Draft Draft Ganger, Burt Stevens. He's I don't know what number he is in the world anymore. Probably not number one anymore. Let's see. Draft Ganger Pocket Fives. He was high at some point. Currently only number 17 in the world. All-time high was number one. It's pretty good. Let's see where Ape Styles is. He plays on mostly, I think, some of the, the other sites. So yeah, all-time high number three, you know. So we had someone who was number three in the world at one point, right here. Someone who was number one in the world at one point, right here. We have Cavalito, we have... I mean, really, all these players are literally world-class. What I did is um, I am an advisor for the Pokar backing company, and I realized that they have a really good private training site that almost no one, well, no one besides their backees have access to. And they're, you know, they're advisors. So I went through and I found the content that I learned a lot from. And that's fantastic. Where do you look at those rankings? Google any online player's name and then type in pocket fives. Will that book be available for audiobook? Yes, it will be. I have to actually get in the studio and record it. Jonathan with a beard. This is not a beard. This is just two days of not shaving. 
you have any favorite poker quotes? Here's, here's one Anthony says. Don't play out of your bankroll. <laughs> um, is there any real money poker sites that I recommend? Party Poker and Poker Stars. Do you live in Illinois? Um, no. Do you all see America's Card Room? They, they had a real party this weekend where they canceled the tournament. and You know, told you all this many years ago. Told you just recently, a year or two ago. The ACR shills came out of the woodwork trying to call me an idiot. But, hey... Time will tell. I hope, I hope I'm, I'm very wrong about all these online American sites. I really hope that I am wrong, but I know I'm not. <laughs> Those Jonathan sounded like a know-it-all again. He, he, is, he knows these sites that are operating in a shady area are probably not going to succeed. Yeah, who'd have thought? Listen, when you have a CEO who is on the internet spending his time trolling people who are trying to help the poker community, you know that you're probably going to fail. And that's what ACR has. Anyway, be smart. Don't keep any of your money on these sites. If I had you tell you to play on any of these sites, I'd tell you Bovada. Bovada is a site that has been skirting the law for a very long time. They're also very recreational player friendly. And um, they've done the best job of getting around the law. That said, don't put significant money on any of these sites. But yeah, so anyway... Excelling at tough to limit holding games. I learned, I've learned a ton from the Pokar Backing Company. I mean, I the whole reason I became an advisor was to get access to their training site. Uh, and um, I'm sharing that with some of you. Well, whoever wants to get the book. So yeah, I'm really excited about this one. This one took a lot of work. You know, every time I go, what's happening with XSplit right now? Huh, that was weird. I moved my head one way and it glitched out. Did it glitch out on your ends for a second right there? Let me know. Um... Every time I do a book with a lot of people, I'm always like, okay, this is going to be a nice, easy project. But it took forever. How about Ignition and Bovada? Did you literally just hear what I said, Michael? Is WorldSeriesPoker.com reliable or shady? Is it a licensed, regulated site within America? That's the question. Is it licensed and regulated within America? Then the answer is yes, right? WSOP is licensed and regulated within America, and therefore you will have no problems. There may be issues with like maybe cash outs take a little bit of time because of more security, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but they're significantly more legit. I mean, they're owned by publicly traded companies within America. They're not going to like be infested with bots or straight up cheat you or just straight up not pay you, right? Let's not get on this topic again, everyone. Why in the world do all of you always want to talk? to talk about this topic. Don't play on shady sites that are run by people who sit on Twitter all day trying to berate people for no reason. There you go. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any more things to discuss today? I actually have to get to work. I don't think I have anything else to discuss today. I went for the text in the middle. Good choice. Yeah, so we had two options for the... for the What is that? Oh, I know what that is. Risk premium. Um, I had two this, I had two different options for the cover. Actually, I had like 50 different options. I only showed you all two, and it was like 50-50 the vote, which means it probably just doesn't matter. But I like this cover. You all want to know a problem with publishing? This title, what is the name of this book? That was the problem. Is this the name of this book Excelling at Tough No Limit Holding Games Powered by Pokar? Or is it just Excelling at Tough No Limit Holding Games? Well, this Jonathan Littles is assumed to be the author, right? So that's fine. That gets ignored. The book's title is Excelling at Tough No Limit Hold'em Games, not Excelling at Tough No Limit Hold'em Games Powered by Pokar. So we could take Powered by Pokar, move it to the bottom or something, and then it's obviously not part of the title, but then it breaks up this nice, very symmetrical block of people. Think about these things that I think about. What's going on with my brain, huh? For some reason, I love symmetry and really didn't like it when they were mixed up. You don't love playing on shady sites, but it's all you can do if you want to play online. Indeed, play for small stakes and keep very little money on there, which is exactly what Mark does. And then don't be pissed if the site cheats you or takes your money or doesn't pay you or they don't run their tournaments. They have a big guarantee and then they just decide to cancel it because they're not going to get there. Right? Realize that that is par for the course and that if you play on those sites, that is what you're accepting. And if you promote those sites, I'm talking to all the content producers out there, realize that you are saying you think this is good business practice. And um, I don't think that's good business practice, which is why I would literally never promote any of these sites. Never. And the fact that um, 
if you actually promote the site, you may be liable for them if they get in trouble legally. You could be in trouble legally, according to my lawyer, who's very good at gaming law. So does Jonathan Little want to go to jail for promoting something that may screw his fans? No. No, we don't want to do that. Which sites are these? The ones that are not licensed and regulated within America or the ones that are operating within America, right? Like Poker Stars is fine because they're not operating within America, except for the places where they are actually legally licensed, right? Go, go listen to jonathanlittlepoker.com slash USA. That's a video that got the shills out the woodwork trying to discredit me. But that's because they know that it's factually accurate and that they are promoting something that is bad for their fans because they don't really mind burning their fans all that often. Sad but true. What is Poker? Poker is a backing company that backs players in tournaments ranging from $5 buy-ins all the way up to $10,000 buy-ins. They're a money printing machine and they have a, an amazing training site, like a good training site. It's kind of disorganized. All training sites get disorganized, get disorganized eventually, but they actually have a, very, a lot of good content that is very private. And they were nice enough to let me work with their coaches to make some of that content into written format, and it is excellent. Chapter I actually learned the most from, I think, was, well, two chapters. I learned a lot about progressive knockout tournaments from Cavalito here. Cavalito is an absolute crusher. I don't know how he does online. Let's see. I don't think he plays the volume a lot of people do. He's out there enjoying life and playing a lot of live poker. Oh, got to go back. Got to go back. Oh, here we go. That's how I do this. Oh, number ni number 91 in the world. Not so bad. Top 100 online player in the world. Wasn't even didn't even know that. Number 43 all-time high just recently, last year. Yeah, cuz like I said he was out there enjoying the life. Um, I learned a lot about from his chapter about progressive knockout tournaments. I actually went recently to play online. I went out of the country to play online and I played progressive knockout tournaments. And I took a second and a, did I win one? No, I took a second and a like fourth or something in high stakes online progressive knockout tournaments. I never really played them before because I didn't really have a good framework for understanding it. But his chapter really helped me with that. And I also learned a lot from Giraffe Ganger's chapter. His chapter is all on playing the middle stack and the final table, which may be the most difficult thing in the world to do. And he talks about having limping strategies, talks about... Um, when to play aggressively, when not to play aggressively, et cetera, et cetera. And I learned a ton. So anyway, those were great. Did I play on 888? No. Michael Acevedo, good morning, good morning. You can vouch for the Pokar pros to be sickos. They are sickos. They are absolute sickos, and I'm glad to be working with them and part of the team. You might be chip missing chipping up, but is there a general rule or style for chipping up, and should you start playing tighter ranges or less hands once you get chipped up? No, listen, realize that... Once you become the big sack, if anything, you need to be leaning on the short sacks in tournaments. You need to be applying more aggression to them because now they can go broke and you can't. As you chip up more, you get to apply even more pressure. So it's the opposite. What a lot of people think is, all right, I've doubled up, so now I can be tight and wait for good hands. No, 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 no. Now that you've doubled up, you can really play a lot of hands and try to win the poker tournament and get a significant stack. So, no. No. All right, well, I have to go now. I have a webinar, so my students coming up in literally 12 minutes. Hope you enjoyed today. If you did, click like, click subscribe. That goes a long way to helping the various algorithms know that you like my work. If you don't like my work, well, don't come back on Wednesday because I'll be here again. Wednesday, bright and early, 10 a.m. Eastern time here for you. Louis Philippe says, Modern Poker Theory by Michael Acevedo, who's in the Instagram chat. Good morning, good morning says that uh, the three best scenarios has a lot of the chip-up plays covered, and they it's a really, really good book. It absolutely is. Modern Poker Theory is great. Here it is. Modern Poker Theory. Go get it. It's a very, very great book. Also, check out pokercoaching.com slash GTO right now. Go there. Michael has a few videos there discussing the most common spots that you will encounter and how to play them from a GTO point of view and how to adjust to take advantage of your opponents and how to... Adjust based on, based on general tournament um, scenarios. So check it out, pokercoaching.com slash GTO. 10 a.m. Eastern time? Yes. Monday, Wednesday, Friday when I'm at home, 10 a.m. Eastern time. Mm, I, will, I don't know if I'm going to be doing this on Friday because I'm actually going to Las Vegas for a retreat with my employees. We're going to be discussing many, many things, including website organization. So, um, yeah. The Nomad says you have 
Modern Poker Theory on your coffee table right now. Well, excellent. Glad to hear you. Or glad to hear you. Get in there and read it. It's a good book. Look, it's a picture book. Look at all the pretty pictures. Lots of charts, lots of graphs, lots of strategies that will help you learn to play fundamentally sound, and it teaches you how to adjust to crush your opponents. So check it out. Oh, 10 a.m. Eastern time. No, no, no. Thank you, Mr. Fuss. Mr. Fuss, Mr. Foos, one of the two. 9 a.m. Eastern time. I don't even know when I do this webinar, everyone. I'm sorry. I roll out of bed, I take care of my kids, and then I do, a, I do this uh, show with a little coffee in the morning. If you miss any of these, you can find all the replays on YouTube at youtube.com slash pokercoaching, or if you want them in audio format, you can listen to these on all the podcast apps. Search the Poker Coaching Podcast with Jonathan Little. So yeah, 9 a.m. Eastern Time, 6 a.m. Pacific. I don't know what time in England. Sorry. <sighs> it's a mild miracle I can put together my thoughts for an hour for you in the morning. It's good, though. It gets me up and gets me working for all of you. Have a great day. Enjoy yourselves. Be nice to someone. It's Monday. Make the most of it. Knock out everything so that you can have a very good, productive life. I wish all of you the best of luck and hope you have a great, great day. Like I said, click, like, click, subscribe, and check out pokercoaching.com slash GTO. For a limited time, you can get a big discount on Poker Coaching Premium and access to the great content that Michael Acevedo has made. So check it out, pokercoaching.com slash GTO. Bye-bye.